Dr. Diller earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh, a master's degree in clinical psychology from Loyola Uni College in Maryland, and a doctor of psychology degree in clinical psychology from the University of Hartford. He spent 19 years in clinical practice and served as a clinical supervisor for 10 years. In his current role since 2016, he has been passionate about finding better ways to support coworkers, raising awareness of mental health issues in the workplace, and offering ways to provide a culture of caring to support overall well being. And he is the director of employee assistance program at Wellspan Health. And if I may say so, Dr. Diller, an all around great guy. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Dr. Diller. Thank you so much. Kim, thank you. Um, just so appreciate you, first of all. And when I found out you were my host today, I was like, very cool, Kim Kreider. This is, this will be good. So uh, I want to say good morning to everyone here. Uh, thank you for taking some time to, to join me today. I do want to certainly at the end uh, provide opportunities for some, some questions and answer um, or any comments that you may have. We don't have a huge group here today, so um, I'm not sure, Kim, if we have the chat availability. You can do it that way. Kim can probably keep an eye on the, the chat. Um, I like to try to stay focused with you as much as I can. Um, I prefer to be in person with folks, but right now, as we know, this, this, the pandemic, the last 14 months, this, is, this has the, been the, kind of the way uh, of the world and, and trying to stay connected. So I'm here with you today. I'm glad you're here with me. And we're talking about COVID-19, the pandemic, one year into it. When I even look at my title on the screen, I'm thinking the toll on our mental health and well-being. It just so happens now we've rolled into May, and May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so this fits very nicely into the conversation. Uh, you'll see some, some, some statistics, some stats later I'm going to share with you uh, kind of the impact of the mental health on mental health and our overall well-being. And some of them are pretty staggering, so I'll share them with you. Um, but I just, I just, I was just in another event this morning and even yesterday with some senior leaders at, at Wellspan Health. And uh, the conversation was about this, just being tired, just being fatigued, just waiting for the next, when can we get past the pandemic so that we can move forward with our lives to have some sense of normalcy. And this is, this is something like no one has ever experienced. One of the leaders yesterday I shared, I'll, I'll share this with you, said his seven-year-old daughter said, so um, your last pandemic, what was that like for you, dad? Uh, and he said, this, this, this is the only one I've ever been a part of. So he's going through it with her. Um, I found that pretty telling just because the eyes of a child sometimes can give us insights that we never see or we sometimes forget as we get older. Um, but this truly has impacted us every single one of us, our mental health, our overall whole person well-being, because mental health is in, 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 um, intricately tied together with our overall well-being. So I'm going to, again, welcome you here together today. I'm so glad you made time, because one thing that I do know that the, the past uh, 14 months, um, here's, another, here's another stat. So Wall Street Journal was just reported a couple weeks ago in, in an article that Americans across the country have saved 60 million hours of commute time. 60 million hours of commute time. Where do you think most of those hours went? If you said work, if you thought work, that's exactly where most of those hours went. So um, creating time and space is difficult. You've committed some time today in a great event uh, for, uh, that I'm glad that you're a part of. I get to be a part of a little bit of that with you today, and I'm glad that you joined me. So we can go to the first slide. Um, this is, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to end with this. This will be close to the ending as well. I often like to do a mood setter. Let's set the tone. And I'm just a big believer in kindness. If anything stands out to me in this past 14 months, but it was really even before this, it's the power of just taking a moment to be present with someone, to check in with someone, to touch base with someone, to ask them, how are they doing today? How are you really doing today? Taking a brief moment to smile, even if it's behind the mask, we could smile with our eyes. Being kind, because we never know what truly happens with someone else's life story. We all live, we all live a story. We have a story to tell, but often we don't know truly what's going on in someone's story. So kindness provides affirmation that no matter how bad the situation, there is, there are still caring people in the world. 
And here's another one underneath this. This is one that I aspire to every day in terms of try to live. Um, and it's by Maya Angelou. I've, I've had this for years, long before the pandemic, but I think this is very telling and it's very um, important that we don't lose sight of this as well. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So if we can keep that as a theme we run through today, this will be a good piece that you can take away. The kindness piece, compassion. All right, these are objectives. We're gonna talk a little bit about the pandemic, the uh, its toll on our mental health. I've touched on a little bit of that already. I'll get into a little bit more of this in details there. Um, you know, and then I'm also going to talk about resilience, our ability to bounce back from adversity and challenge. How do we weather storms that we've never been a part of before? And this is one that we've never been truly a part of before. Um, there's also a tool at the end, uh, and I'll, I'm going to highlight some of that. It's a well-being assessment tool. We all can do it, and it's very simple and easy. I'll go over that at the end. It's a takeaway from you, for you, from me, uh, but it's also um, uh, something that's easy to use and can really kind of give you a starting point. This is where I am now. This is where I'd like to be and where I'd like to go and give you a couple areas that you can work on. Much more than just mental health, it's really whole person well-being. I'm a big believer that um, really it's, it's all pieces that fall under overall whole person well-being and health. So uh, then I'm going to leave you with a few resources at the end that will be right at your fingertips. You can click on, you can, uh, you can uh, copy, uh, and you can share widely. Um, so there'll be several of those throughout the presentation and even at the end. Okay, next. All right, this, this slide came out early into the pandemic, and this was when we were still talking about the first wave. That was April of 2020. So March is when everything shut down. I'll never forget it. March 13th was the last day I spent in my office. I had it on a desk calendar, Friday the 13th. And then we went home for about two weeks is what we were told, if you can recall that. And then um, after that, we didn't come back. Now, I have come back periodically to my office, but I generally work from home now, and I, I move from, from my home setup. Those 60 million hours of commute time that are saved, I'm part of that 60 million hours saved. But this really was the first peak. We had another one in July in the, in the summer of 2020, not as big as the first one. We were all in it together to try to work on flattening the curve. If you remember those words, that's got, we got to stay together. We're in this together. Let's flatten the curve. And we did a really, really good job of being able to do that. What we didn't know was how truly long this, this storm was really going to, to unfold. We had no idea that it was going to continue uh, and even today where things are. And then in November, December, we had the largest peak, the largest surge, and our health system felt that greatly, but not just our health system, it was across the country. Um, and so what ends up happening is, so natural disasters have a, a beginning and an end. So Hurricane Katrina had a beginning and an end, and then you have a recovery period. So you know when we can start to pull things together and then the next chapter starts to unfold, at least uh, it, it, there's, there's this start, starting point and an end point, and this is where the recovery begins. With COVID-19 and the pandemic, we never really truly had a beginning. We never, we still don't have an end, even though right now the shots of hope, we call that at WellSpan, the shots of hope with our vaccines, trying to get as many vaccines uh, in, uh, in arms, shots in arms as possible to try to reclaim that sense of normalcy. Even with that, there is still uncertainty and that creates stress. Here's another factor. As human beings, we like to have predictability. We like to be in control. This storm, and one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Kathy Jansen, is a fellow psychologist, and she's a trauma expert, works in crisis intervention. She's just an amazing person also. Early on, when we were preparing to find ways to support our health system and then our community members at large, she mentioned something to me, and I'll never forget these words. Mike, we're dealing with something we've never dealt with before. I, yep, got that. You're absolutely right. I have no idea what this is really going to unfold and look like. She referred to COVID-19 as a slow behemoth of a storm, but yet it's rapidly changing and slow moving and unfolding with no end in sight. And this was back, this conversation I had with her was around the same time this graphic came out nationally, was shared throughout health systems and beyond. Um, this comment that she made turned out to be absolutely true. And what we do know is the longer you're under stress, if you bring that out, if you expand that over time, that creates even more impact on our overall well-being. Physical well-being, emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, 
mental health well-being, um, all of it. The one wave, these were called, the actual title of this graphic was the four waves of the coronavirus. The one wave that I was concerned about from the beginning was the fourth wave. Because if you see that line, over time, what ends up happening is the psychological and emotional impact of whatever it is we're dealing with, the multiple stressors. And you think about this, it's not just one storm that has unfolded during these last 14 months. Multiple things have happened uh, you know, under the, the larger umbrella of the storm of COVID-19, this pandemic that we still find ourselves in now. So when you draw that out, you go through the long winter, and you know, we end up getting even more isolated and we were already struggling with being able to stay connected. It adds you know, to the toll that it, it takes on all of us. Okay, next slide. So just a few numbers here. This was through NIH. This came rolling through the summer, but these numbers were very telling to me. This was looking at the workplace. So as an EAP, an employee assistance program, we provide support to many employers throughout South Central Pennsylvania uh, and beyond, but generally in the South Central Pennsylvania area, our WellSpan health footprint from Franklin County to Lancaster, Lebanon County, and anywhere in between. But this was really telling because this was our workforce. It doesn't matter what type of industry, this was across the board. But you think about this, relative to 2019 to 2020, depression was four times as high, the rates of depression in the same time of 2020 than it was in, in 2019. Anxiety three times as high uh, as it was the year prior, same time period. The, the last 75% of 18 to 24 year olds, so that's our Gen Z group, that's my daughter. My daughter falls right into the Gen Z group. They have been the hardest hit during this pandemic in terms of the emotional and psychological impact of this pandemic. All of us have been, but again, each one of us lives a story. This group, has been impacted the most significantly. When you take a look at that, have reported at least one adverse mental or, uh, mental or behavioral health symptom uh, during the summer months. And this was before we got to the surge, the greatest surge at the end during the holidays of 2020. Okay, next slide. A lot of numbers here. I won't go through all of them. They are, I will make sure that you have access to the PowerPoint and the slide deck because I want you to be able to have them. Uh, it's just part of what I believe in. If we have, if we believe that we're passionate in being able to share something that we feel that's important that other people could benefit from, then we need to share that. So these slides will be yours. This is really about you. My time today together with you is really about you. And I appreciate again, the opportunity to be in front of you or with you, not just really in front of you, with you. So the top line were two epidemics that were present before the pandemic. The two epidemics were overdose uh, deaths related to primarily opioid op overdose. Most people will not even have to blink an eye to think about, yeah, that's absolutely what was going on before the pandemic. And suicide deaths, all time high. They've can, actually 2016, they hit a 30 year high from 1986 to 2016. And then from there, they didn't go down. We roll into 2020, they've worsened. So the pandemic has not helped that as well. Uh, and so those are things that we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of because people are struggling, people are having difficulties and we need to make sure that we get that message out, continue that conversation. See right now, most people are more open to talking about mental health than we have probably been ever before, at least in my lifetime. And I think there are people um, in this space and you're here with me today, that we just need to be able to find ways to continue this conversation. Um, and so, again, I appreciate being able to do this together with you today, because this is an opportunity to have this discussion. So 90% of Americans were experiencing issues with mental health over this past year related to the pandemic. I would, I would venture to say that 100% um, of us have been touched in some way by the pandemic uh, and, and in terms of our overall mental health. I have not met one person, not one person. I've met a lot of people during these last 14 months that have said otherwise. Uh, they've given me examples on how this has truly impacted them. So I'm gonna go down to the bottom because a lot of times when people say, well, gosh, you know, Mike's gonna give a talk on mental health. He's just gonna focus on the mind. Um, it, and it's really to me about mind, body, spirit or mind, body, soul, this interconnectedness. Look at the bottom, the last three lines, the last three bullet points, okay? The American Psychological Association put out a study uh, uh, last month and they were looking at the impact, not just on mental health and emotional well-being, the psychological impact, they were looking at physical factors. So this is across the country. Look at those stats. 67% of Americans said that they were sleeping more or less than desired. 
Uh, this is during the pandemic. This was March. These were numbers and survey done in March. So we're past the peak, the last peak of the fall. We're starting to see some signs of hope, better days and better, better tomorrows ahead, which I firmly believe absolutely are in our future. But this is the toll. We can't undo what has happened. We can't unring the bell that has been rung. 25% of Americans um, drinking more alcohol, not just drinking more alcohol, but to specifically to cope with their stress. So that's another factor that ties into that. And then 42% of Americans had undesired weight gain. This is the one that I had to do a double take. Um, the average weight gain was 29 pounds in these last 14 months. I'm thinking, is that a misprint? I don't think the American Psychological Association is gonna put that out. If they, that, that, that's not a misprint. Average weight gain, 29 pounds. 42% of Americans have had undesired weight gain. So what happens here affects us everywhere. So I just wanted to make sure that I shared that with you as well. And this is, today, we're gonna to take some time to recognize where we are, a chance to reflect on where we are. Um, and again, we all live a story. We all tell a story as much as we're willing to share, but we truly all have a story that we live every day. And most people don't know truly what that is. So this pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic has impacted us uh, in ways that we probably never ever foresaw. Um, and today I'm going to take some time to be able to reflect on that, kind of just this presentation is truly for you to take a look at what has happened, where we are now, and where do we go moving forward? What are the opportunities to make sure that we do practice strategies that can take care of ourselves and build and grow resilience? So you'll see a couple of things. I'm going to share a video with you. It's five minutes. It's going to create at least a little time, and my hope, my intent is that it'll create a little reflection for you about maybe where you've been because it can stir things that way, but also the opportunity to invite you to think about what maybe have I learned moving forward about myself and about what the, those tomorrows will truly be. Next slide. Okay, a lot of times when I give presentations, depending on who my audience is, so if I'm in front of a group, um, you know, sometimes I'm giving data and charts and graphs and things like that. I'm not going to hit you with charts and graphs. Uh, I've given you enough in terms of some statistics. <clears throat> so today I'm going to share a tree with you. Uh, this tree came out early on. Uh, it's from Dr. Uh, 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 Anna Allman from uh, Columbia University. And I remember being in this presentation and I saw this. These are nine tips. They're all evidence-based. They're backed by research. And I saw this tree and I'm thinking, this is fantastic. Can we share this? And I remember reaching out to the Jed Foundation. The Jed Foundation is a national organization that's around for 20 years, dedicated to emotional and psychological well-being of our teens and young adults. Fantastic. They had a national presentation. This slide came up. I'm like, I love this slide. I've shared it widely. A lot of people like this slide. This slide will be is available for you to share widely. When I asked them, can I share this, copyrights, things like that, they said, share widely with your networks. So I never look back. I'm sharing widely. And this is one for you. So I'm not going to hit all nine today, but I am going to hit on a few. So if you look on the left-hand side, my left-hand side, the lowest hanging fruit, I call it, or the lowest hanging branch is engaged in self-care. So when you think about self-care, people are like, okay, I can self-care. I know what that means. I'd, Sometimes people really don't know what that truly means for themselves. How do I take care of myself? How do I create time and space to make sure that I do a little self-care for my own well-being? And again, that's going to be unique to me. What Mike Diller does is going to be different than what Kim Crater may do. Or it could be someone else. I'm looking on the screen here. I'm going to pick on Pam Johns. It could be Pam Johns and whatever Pam does. It's going to be unique to what you do for yourself to make sure that you're caring for yourself. But I got to tell you, so if you don't do these things, all else rests upon our self-care, even the basics. So psychology 101, people are going to remember Abraham Maslow, most likely. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The bottom of the pyramid is the first, it's the foundation, right? So the foundation is the key, I call the bare basics. You got to make sure you're hydrating. You got to make sure you're fueling properly with nutritional fuel. You got to make sure you're resting. You're making sure you get your sleep. Um, I throw in movement there. Maslow didn't have movements, but I think you need to be able to move. If anything has happened during this pandemic for those that have had to work from home, we have part of the, 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 the correlation, the relationship with weight gain is that we've been sitting more. We've been sedentary more. We're not going out as much. 
uh, we're not moving as much. So you got to take care of the bare basics and then you move up the pyramid. You don't progress on the pyramid unless you take care of the bare basics. It all starts there, self-care. And I got to tell you, you know, uh, at the top of the pyramid is truly what he would call self-actualization. What other people would call this has been kind of this model has been transformed in different ways and moved into the business area of well in terms of the business world. And so we talk about be your best self. How am I going to be my best self? If you don't take care of the bottom of the pyramid, the lowest hanging branch or fruit right there, you will never be able to progress fully to being your best self. So sometimes it's just making sure I start there, take care of my bare basics, and then we'll move from there. Um, the one other one I'm going to go up to. Uh, and I'm going to hit on connect. If you look at the resilience research, so resilience, you have to have an adverse event to have resilience. If everything is running smoothly in my life, resilience isn't truly necessary. You need to have, there's going to be an, so the adverse event has just been the last 14 months and everything that has unfolded. But, you know, the, look at yourself. If I just look at myself in the mirror and I can just reflect back on my life, there have been multiple things that I've had challenges with and I've struggled with, and I've had to at least find ways, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to navigate this? That's where we get a chance to tap into resilience. This tips to weather harsh seasons, growing resilience, these nine strategies, tips, they're all evidence-based, like I said, and they all matter. What rises to the top of resilience research, you'll see it time and time again. I was just part of a, a presentation yesterday when trauma and crisis intervention and crisis response to traumatic events. And that expert, um, Jeff Lading at Loyola University down in, in Maryland, he, Dr. Dr. Lading, talked about social support being the number one factor, and it rises to the top of the resilience research every time. And sometimes it's just one trusted relationship that can make all the difference in the world. So connection, social support. And I know it's been difficult. It has absolutely been difficult because um, uh, we've had to do this. We've had to socially distance. And then we went through the winter months and it was harder to get outside and be with people. And, but I got to tell you, here's, here's the underlying piece with connection. If you can, even through this, be able to connect in a meaningful way, that's what's going to matter. And sometimes it's just with one person to be able to do that. And sometimes it's not even through video. It can just be a phone call. It can be a quick text when someone just says, some of the best texts or emails I get are, hey, Mike, how are you doing? Thinking of you today. I've actually started keeping some of those in, in what I call an inspiration file. The inspiration file is when I'm having a tough moment or a tough day, I can check into that and it helps lift me at least in those moments. But what has truly lifted me was someone that took the time to just say, hey, Mike, how are you doing today? Thought of you. And all of that matters. One last thing on the other side of the tree, right close to the bottom of that one is, and, and I'll touch on the last one on forgiveness, but flexible, being flexible. A lot of times that is challenging for us because like I said to you earlier, as human beings, we're hardwired to, we prefer to have predictable, comfortable, and controllable. So if I can have those three things, I'm golden, I'm good. However, the pandemic has challenged us in all of those areas. And, and at times it may feel like, oh my gosh, what do I have control over? And it will take work to figure that out and focus on sometimes maybe small pieces of what I have some control over. But being flexible is something like, so uh, Carol Dweck is a psychologist who did research on the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. We're not gonna go into great detail, but the growth mindset is really what I'm talking about here. It allows for flexibility. So if I, aspire to do something, I set up a goal, and I fail. What do I do with that failure? That failure to me, if you have a growth mindset, if you are flexible in your thinking, allows you to move, allows you to be flexible, to take away something from that failure or something that didn't happen or go according to plan and grow from it to find some meaning. What's my takeaway? What did I learn from that? As opposed to fixed mindset, fixed mindset is I did the same thing and it didn't work out. Well, I guess that's it. I'm not going to do that again. I've, I'm, I've failed. And uh, that's the end of that path. That door is now closed. I look at that as we've never truly gained a success unless we absolutely have failed in some way. And you'll hear some words that have been shared. I, I've heard it at Wellspan as well. Uh, fail forward. And I was like, fail forward? Fail forward? It actually makes sense. It's kind of like falling forward and we get back up and we fail forward and we learn from that and we're able to be flexible. 
So those are three that stand out to me. I wanted to highlight those from the tree and the tree will be for you. Next slide. So I had a presentation um, uh, with uh, another fellow colleague of mine and uh, we, just, we just did, uh, Dr. Mitch Crawford oversees our addictions program for at Wellspan uh, Health and he's from Wellspan Philhaven which falls under Wellspan Health. Fantastic person uh, and just, just an expert mind. Um, and we got together when we were doing, and we were actually doing a presentation on COVID-19 one year into the pandemic. So some of these slides I pulled together from our work together. When we sat down, we were preparing for the first presentation. We've done it a few times at different places within WellSpan. Um, we came up with some of these tips. Now, some of these are gonna be more work focused, but they can be translated into everyday life outside of work. So I'm just gonna go through some of them uh, quickly. Some of them you're gonna see, wait a minute, they were on the tree, that was on the tree. So they are definitely uh, connected. So schedule time to eat. That may sound like, what do you mean schedule time to eat? That's a no brainer, right? Well, I gotta tell you that there have been times if you've been in my life um, that I stay glued to the TV, not the TV. I wish it was a TV sometimes. It's screens, computer screens. And I'm, I'm working and I'm working. And I know, because I'm telling people every day, make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure you have time. Are you hydrated? Did you get food? Did you eat today? And then my wife will come up sometimes and she'll say, are you eating lunch today? Oh, I was supposed to do that two hours ago. And I got caught up in this and I got caught up in that. It's easy to get caught up in the whirlwind. It's harder to just take time to make sure we create that space to take care of ourselves. That's the bottom of the pyramid. It's one of the pieces. It's one of the foundational pieces. If we don't have that, everything else rests upon that. You don't have the foundation to keep building to be at your best. Practice mindfulness. That's just being able to slow things down. You, I do this, hand, I talk with my hands a lot. So the gesture of getting caught up in the whirlwind, we get that sometimes, we get pulled in. Next thing you know, we're like, oh my gosh, there's a lot going on, what do I do? Um, mindfulness in its most basic form is, can I be present in this moment? So can you be with me right now and just not be judgmental, to be connected, to be grounded to all the senses, our five senses for sometimes even 30 seconds, one minute, and there are meditations, all kinds of meditations out there within mindfulness practice that can just help us stay grounded. One of my favorite one is a one minute meditation. I, I, I do that one often. Most of us can create 60 seconds of time to just breathe and be present. Okay, gratitude. I'm grateful again, like I mentioned to you uh, in terms of just you making time to be here with me. And I gotta also tell you gratitude, there is physical, data hard science that shows the physiological emotional and psychological benefits of being grateful so sometimes we're going through challenging times and it can be very difficult um i don't know if anyone has ever heard of david steindl ross uh, if you ever heard of david steindl ross he is amazing he's done a couple um, uh, um ted talks on happiness and being grateful and the power of gratefulness uh and what it does for I, I sometimes think about not just our psychological well-being, our emotional well-being, but sometimes even our spiritual well-being, our whole person uh, self. So gratitude. Do brief intermittent exercises. So this is where sometimes I'm glued to my chair. So when I went home, I didn't really have an office set up very well. Uh, I just made, made do. And I thought, well, it will be temporary. So I had an antique wooden chair that I sat on for eight months until my lower back started hurting. And I'm thinking, this is not good. And I had friends saying, why are you still sitting on that wooden chair? I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm, I got used to it, it's fine. But the other thing I realized is I'm sitting too long. I'm not doing the same kinds of activity and movement that I did before. So get up. Sometimes it's even scheduling it in the day where I'll even put it on my schedule, move, fuel. It's in my schedule among all the other meetings that may be there. Again, just to remind myself, Mike, create the time and space. You need to start there. Um, requesting external support. I look at this as internal support, external support. We lean on each other. We're, and it, and we, if we can do this and we can create a community where we can lean on one another and we also therein uh, create opportunities to lift one another up. And sometimes the smallest gesture of kindness and compassion and caring can absolutely do that. And also, even if, it, if it's more serious and you may need to get some counseling support, again, I live in this space every day and we certainly wanna make sure that that's available to people as well and encourage people if they need to, to be able to do that as a sign of wisdom and strength and not weakness. 
of spirituality and faith. When I talk to Mitch, doc, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Crawford, this is something that's very big in both of our lives, and it's particularly his. He has a couple other friends that he actually gets with, and they get a chance to um, just kind of reflect moments of reflection. So it doesn't have to be organized religious beliefs, but it can just be time for spiritual reflection and 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 sometimes it's done in a kind of community way with a few other folks and that's what he had shared and i so appreciated that we added that instead of having hour meetings we actually started doing some things and i've tried to do better at this making them 15 minutes shorter so that we can actually create time and space from what my my one my former boss used to say mike i need to make sure i have bio breaks built into my schedule i was like bio breaks what i was like i like that i like that so Bio breaks, whatever that may look like for you, it's going to be important for you to make sure that you create time and space, 45 minutes instead. And do you need a whole hour? Sometimes now I started doing 30 minute meetings because I wanted to try to create space. Um, assume positive intent. It's one of our core values at Wellspan. We have five of them and this is one of them. I want to make sure that I don't necessarily go to the negative. If someone is trying to do something, convey something, express a concern to me, an idea, I want to make sure that I, I assume or give them that um, grace of positive intent. Um, encourage, it goes back to the whole idea of kindness and compassion and caring, building that culture. So encourage others to take care of themselves, making sure that we encourage others to do that. I gotta tell you some of the most important people in my life have been people that have reminded me, Mike, are you taking care of yourself? What are you doing? Um, and I've appreciated that and uh, more than they, than they probably ever know. Allow those that you lead to make sure they take time to separate from work. One of the things that I remember from um, time when I was going through different trainings, one of the greatest trainings I ever went to was on a substance abuse training. But this is, I didn't take away, I did take away some things there. This is 15 years ago. The one thing that I took away from this presenter, um, Corey Newman, Dr. Newman's out of the University of Pennsylvania was this tip. He said, doing this work will tax you. It will weigh heavy on you. You need to make sure you take care of yourself. And he, he shared two words. He said, I'm going to share two words with you. Contrasting interests. Contrasting interests. I was like, okay, I'm writing down notes. Contrasting interests. What does that mean? Contrasting interests. Do something different. Do something different than you do every day in your professional life. So whatever you do in your professional life, do something different than what you do every day in your professional life. It all speaks to self-care, well-being, the bottom of the pyramid. And so I never forgot those words. Contrasting interests. Do something different. Okay, next slide. Great Realization is a video that I wanted to share with you. It's five minutes long. It gives us a chance to reflect together. Um, if we can do that, Kim. We sure can. Uh, bear with me. I need to stop the share um, and reshare in a different way to get that video to populate. So. Okay. Waiters always look at me, a little salad, maybe a soup, and that'll be the whole meal. And when I do my actual order, this is priceless look on their face. And where'd we go? Get it, Kim. Waiters always look at me and think that uh, I'm going to have a little salad, maybe a I soup, think we got it. And that'll be the whole meal. Just got to skip and when the I do ad my this way. There we go. Tell me the one about the right. Can it? Okay. Not seeing it yet, Kim, so I'm not sure. Is anyone else? No, okay. You're not seeing it? No. Hmm. It's sharing on my end. Let me stop the share. Okay. And try it one more time. I promise you it's worth the five minutes. Do you see it now? Okay, yes. There it is. All right, let me back it up. Tell me the one about the okay. right. Then I'll go to that. 
But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please. Can you hear it, everyone? That's my favourite. I promise just once more. Okay. Snuggle down, my boy, though I know you know full well. The story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's twenty twenty. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick. You could have anything you dreamed of in a day, and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew square and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker, till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped, until each day when you went fishing you'd pull them out, already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies, more convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. While we all were hidden, amidst the fear, and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you, and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe, and the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing. Some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure, and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct, and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realisation. And yes, since then there have been many. But that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's twenty twenty. They know someone's filming it exactly. because they can see. Thank you, Kim. So I know we're going to go back into um, our, our presentation here. That video actually was shared. It was actually created April of 2020. So when I think about that video, it's been shared widely. Um, it is, you know, it is on YouTube. You're, you will have access to the slide, so you could click onto it as well from there. Um, it just, it just makes you reflect and think. And so, you know, the psychologist in me, when when Dr. Crawford and I have done this presentation, um, the first question, and I've let him lead with this because he's a psychiatrist, I'm a psychologist. How does this make you feel? is kind of that people are like, oh gosh, the psychologist is asking me, how does this make me feel? You do not have to answer that. Um, and what were you thinking? Um, I, you know, I'm certainly, you know, I know with time and I wanna make sure we get to some of the comments and questions, um, this does make you reflect. I mean, it, it, I don't know how it wouldn't. Um, and it's not, it doesn't necessarily stir, 
I think it stirs a wide range of emotions. When we've shared this in other groups, and some of this, and we've shared this with with our physicians and docs and different and different uh, uh, and, and other healthcare workers who have been involved with some of the most serious stories that you would ever think and can imagine during this COVID uh, nineteen uh, pandemic, and it has stirred many different um, emotions. Uh, and I'm going to share one with you in terms of just. Um, loss in terms of just this idea of loss. I'm not going to share my own journey because as this is drawn out, COVID-19 has, has impacted my life, not just on the professional side of things, but personally. And I believe that has happened for each one of us to, to whatever extent and degree. But loss is not just about loss of life. Loss, as you've heard me already say today, loss of predictability, loss of control, uh, you know, uh, controllability of what happens in our lives, what happens next the ability to connect socially like we have in the past. I was just in an event today, and I got to tell you, this has been very taxing for me. I'm a hugger, fist bump, handshakes. I love to hug people. So I'm walking in, and this, this other uh, leader from another organization comes up. Hey, Mike, and he puts his hand out. He puts his hand out, and I'm like, I, I went like this with my elbow, and then he quickly turned and went like this. We had, we're masked up, we're, and so we... But I'm like that, and we, I talked about it with him. I said, you know, that crushes me to a degree because I'm thinking, I wanna shake your hand. I wanna hug you. And I know that we need to make sure that we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite there. Just that alone is, is something we took for granted for, for how long? Forever. And now it's something now that creates angst and stress and we have to navigate that. Some people are fine with that. I mean, I, I've been around people and I'm like, they're all hugging. That's not, that's not a good idea necessarily because of where, where we are, but I get it. We're human beings. We're drawn to be able to connect with people. We need human touch, that power of human connection. So loss. David Kessler is an expert, world-renowned expert on grief and loss. He actually worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, so people know the stages, most have heard the stages of grief. He worked with um, Elizabeth, Dr. Kubler-Ross, on, on this uh, uh, theory. He added one though, the sixth stage is meaning, but you have to go through the other stages, not necessarily in order of grief to get to meaning. So before we get there, he made a statement. I heard this early in the pandemic that I never forgot. So what's the greatest loss? I was like, I, right, David, I, please. The greatest loss is your loss. The greatest loss is your loss. And what that does is it creates opportunity for empathy, kindness, and compassion, and puts a pause on judgment, because that's where we get into trouble. We, we hear something that someone may be going through, and to us, maybe it's not as, that wouldn't affect me maybe in that way. I'm not quite sure why you maybe feel that way. It creates pause to avoid judgment, assume positive intent, respect for all, right? Respect each other, and invites us to possibly be present for a little compassion, empathy, and kindness. So I never forgot that. And I will never forget that because it is so true even in my own life um, and the stories that I have heard from others. So if we move to the next slide. So silver linings moves into this idea of, of what David Kessler talks about as the sixth stage of grief, meaning. Now, some people may not be there sometimes they may be there sometimes and other times it's just a bad day uh, and it's a tough day and i've had those uh, I've, I've talked to many people friends family and even my colleagues um, where people will share i feel like i run into a wall i've hit the wall um and i can say because people will say i'm like you're the psychologist what are, what are the answers give us the guidance and i'm thinking well the the key here is that I'm a human being just like you are, and I've hit those walls in, in the last 14 months for sure. There are days that you know, are challenging for me. Um, our minds often, and this is, this is based in science, in fact, as well, evidence, we're hardwired as human beings to think um, to our minds default to the negative. A hundred things we've just done, 99 things go well, right? The one that doesn't, what do we, what do we dwell on? Number one, we're just naturally hardwired to go what's not to what's not going well, what didn't work out well, what what did I fail or did not accomplish today, and we really have to work on. There's a whole field called positive psychology. 
this idea of mindfulness and gratitude and those types of things, it's all based in that school of thought that we need to make sure that we create an intentional effort to acknowledge what, what did I pull away from that? What did I get from that? So I'll share um, some, a silver lining. If we had more time, this is where we would open it up when we did presentations with Dr. Croft and I, we asked people to share. Um, and I know we're gonna run out of time here, but I'll share a quick one. My daughter came home from college and, and I'm working from home in a meeting and she's outside with, with my wife, her mom, and they're laughing hysterically. I couldn't hear a thing going on in the meeting. Normally I would get up and say, uh, in a meeting, can you keep it down? And I just paused for a second to listen to that laughter and I just let it go. So I didn't get everything from the meeting, but what I did get was just the moments of just laughter and joy from my daughter and my wife. And, I, and, and, it, and it, just warmed, it just warmed my heart. And so those pieces, those silver linings, again, that's one example. And I think all of us can at least reflect back on the possibility that there could be these pieces, however small they may be. Um, I think it's important to make sure that the stages of grief didn't really end at five. There's a sixth stage, the idea of silver linings, things that we can take away, things that we've learned. It goes back to this idea of flexibility on the tree. Next slide. So this is uh, a, a tool that I had talked about, a well-being assessment tool. So if you take a look at this, these are different domains of just overall whole person well-being. This is from um, Dr. Edward Phillips out of the VA Boston Healthcare System in Harvard University. I actually was introduced to him through Dr. Crawford. He came, brought him into WellSpan and did a presentation uh, at a grand rounds for physicians and healthcare workers, and he was fantastic. This is a tool, very simple. You basically take a look at each of those domains so moving my body, um, recharging, this, this sleep and refresh, you go down to family, friends, and coworkers and relationships. There are areas where you can say, okay, one to five, one being need, you know, not doing, you know, the, on the low side of scale, five being, um, you know, I'm doing really well. I really probably don't need to work on that one. I feel pretty good. That's where you are now. Where do you want to be? So you go down this list, assess where you are now, do your own inventory, and we, each one of these domains, um, and so if I'm a one where I'm at now on recharging, but I definitely knew, know I need to do better and I want to be uh, a four, that might be that, that one to four, uh, space gives me an opportunity. That might be one that I could start to work on. So that's just an example. You can do a, you can do this quick. You can take a look at this and jot it down. This is where I'm at now. This is where I want to be. The idea is too, is to be realistic. You know, someone puts down five for all of them, you might not, you might not ever get there. So you have to be realistic for yourself. What truly makes sense for you um, in terms of where you aspire to be? Sometimes people are like, I don't really want to be a five for moving the body. I'm, I'm good with right now where I'm at. And so that might not be my goal. Um, I'll share this with you as well. This is just one. This is the actual um, kind of the central piece of the survey. Um, I, I can make sure that Kim has, if people are interested in the full survey, I can send it to Kim and we can make sure that you have it. Um, it gives a little more background on the domains and everything as well. So next slide. So the takeaways today would be, my hope for you would be, what will be different for you? Um, what will you embrace when we move forward? When you think about what just happened in the great realization, there is opportunity, I believe firmly, that we don't, so sometimes people say, I just want it the way it was. I just want it the way it was. Perhaps it can be better than the way it was. And what might we embrace along the way that could help make it better? So better tomorrows, what will they look like for us? We each get to play a role in that. We each get to have a voice in that. Um, what will tomorrow be for you? Next slide. As I said, we started with Be Kind, we started with Maya Angelou, we end it threads all the way through uh, today's conversation. I, after this are resources for you. You're gonna get these, they'll be at your fingertips. If we can scroll through this quickly, Kim, I know we have, I think four minutes and I wanna be mindful of time. So recognizing trauma, we did this internally for our own WellSpan Health employees. We flipped it then for our external community uh, and you're part of our community, Franklin County. So this is this is this is for you as well. It just recognizes signs of of chronic stress and trauma. And then there are other resources here that will give you ideas on what you can do about it. Next slide. One of my favorite is ending your workday. 
one that I still need to aspire to practice. But these are just some quick tips on being able to do some of those things you saw on the tree to stop, reflect, to make sure that you take time to recognize, be grateful, check in with one another. Those, this, this checklist actually has gone out on social media and we got somebody from Seattle that contacted some one of our colleagues at Wellspan and said, hey, I, I appreciate this. So it made it all the way to the C C Seattle. I'm like, this is, this is good. This is for you as well. Next slide. The EAP team, uh, I asked them to come together with a newsletter uh, for one of our parts uh, departments in our um, organization at Wellspan Health. And then we flipped this and, 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 and turned this out for and shared this with our employers. It's really about some key strategies to remember some of those things I touched on today about better things ahead, better tomorrows ahead. What can we do to help ourselves uh, in that space? Next slide. More resources for you, uh, for you to click on and be able to take a look at. There are great resources in all of those. And I think there's one more. So John Newley and Jane Miller uh, are, are mental health first aid and QPR uh, suicide prevention trainings. I, I highlight them because these trainings are national trainings, but these two trainers are just unbelievable. Just because you have a training that can be shared widely by different trainers, um, not all trainers are, are created equal. These two are hugely passionate. And within the WellSpan footprint, they will provide these trainings at no cost. So that website will give you information. So organizations have brought people in like Jane and John to do these types of trainings. And it empowers the non-clinician to recognize signs and symptoms of emotional distress and mental health concerns and challenges and to be able to do something about it. Thank you for your time.